not only did he build relationships throughout the capital to get that legislation passed, but he's an expert in renovations, which is we're going to need to do here with, since we have gas lines busted on us and uh, heat and air systems going out and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, and there was some music that came out of nowhere. And with that, uh, introduce Trace Tom Trey Thompson, the director of the Oklahoma Historical Society, coming all the way down the turnpike again to present the Oklahoma State Capitol Restoration. Well, thank you, Tad. I've been to Claremore so much lately, I think I need to buy a house here or something. It's, uh, which, w which would be good because, well, then I'd probably eat at Hammett House too much and then uh, I'd have problems with my weight and so maybe not. So uh, it's great to be here with you all today. Uh, I am happy to, let me see here, acknowledge, uh, I'm getting these weird messages here. Okay, uh, it is great to be here with you all today. Uh, I became director of the Oklahoma Historical Society a little over a year and a half ago after Dr. Bob Blackburn retired, and uh, it's just been just a thrill for me to be here uh, at the OHS and, of course, the Will Rogers Museum I would consider to be one of the, the gems in our crown, if you will, within the Oklahoma Historical Society uh, uh, group of properties. We have such a great story to tell here about Will Rogers, and I'm so excited with the $7 million that we got, and I know the, the, uh, the board, the Friends Board, has a plan to raise more money to match on top of that so we, that we can improve all of the exhibits here, that we'll find a place, uh, a new building for collections, which we're excited about, right, Jennifer? And a uh, place that we can do uh, events, and so this it's just going to be uh, the next five to seven years out here are going to be really incredible, and we're really excited about it. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the, the restoration of the Oklahoma State Capitol tonight. In 2014, I, I, was, uh, I applied and was given the job to be the project manager on the State Capitol Restoration Project. I worked for the state, so I didn't work for one of the construction companies. Uh, I did work for the state of Oklahoma. If you're familiar with the agency that's called the Office of Management and Enterprise Services, it's the state's administrative agency. And so uh, this is really the first time that they had done something like this. Uh, I had talked to them about the idea of creating this position because I knew that this was not going to be your typical run-of-the-mill construction project. Anytime you're going to do any major project in a building like the state capitol, where you have the legislature, you have the executive branch, you have to be able to, uh, it's a very public building, and so there are a lot of pitfalls and perils that can go along with it, and for whatever reason, I felt like I was the right person to try to navigate all that, uh, but it's why I walk with a limp today, uh, because it was, uh, it was a difficult project. We never, uh, we worked in an occupied building almost the whole time. And so uh, doing the project like that, we only vacated the building for one week in 2017 to make a major electrical switch over. Other than that, we were working in a completely occupied building all the time. And so that in and of itself was a, a big challenge that we had to navigate through uh, logistically the whole time. So I'll start out here talking about in the beginning. I always like to set the scene and talk a little bit about the history of the state capitol. I don't want to assume that everybody just understands how we got to where our capital is and how it got to be built. This is one of my favorite quotes to start out with. I found this quote doing research. It says, it's a safe guess that the building will be there when this and, and several other generations have gone, unless it is attacked by zeppelins, and I don't think there is much danger of that. So that was given by Arthur Lee Craft. He was the secretary of the Capitol Building Commission. And in 1915, when they did the dedication of the cornerstone, the newspaper went around and asked, you know, how long do you think the building will last? And this was my favorite quote out of all that because, I mean, anytime you can include the word Zeppelin, that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, thankfully, he was right. The building has never been attacked by Zeppelins, and I think it's a pretty safe bet that it won't be attacked by uh, zeppelins, although, you know, who knows what may happen in the future. This is a little bit of timeline on the history of the Capitol itself. So November 16, 1907, the o Oklahoma enters the Union. Grab my water here. Um, June 11, 1910, Governor Charles Haskell is the first governor of the state of Oklahoma. 
Now, in the Enabling Act that was passed into law in 1906, it said that Guthrie was going to be the state capital until 1913. So all the folks in Guthrie were feeling pretty good that they were going to get to keep the capital at least for a little while. Well, what ends up happening is Charles Haskell says, I don't like Guthrie. Guthrie's a Republican town. I don't like that Frank Greer, the publisher of the newspaper, keeps criticizing the Democrats in government and particularly me. So let's get the heck out of here. So he gets an initiative petition together, they get enough signatures, and there's an election on June 11th of 1910. Now June 11th is a Saturday, it's not a Tuesday. And it was originally set for the Tuesday, but he scratched it out and said we're going to have the election on a Saturday because he didn't want to give the folks in Guthrie a chance to go in. The courts are closed on Sunday, so they couldn't go in the next day and contest it, although they ultimately ended up contesting it anyway. So Oklahoma City wins the election but it gets invalidated by the Oklahoma Supreme Court on a technicality. Now, that's later down the road. What Guthrie didn't plan on is after the election happened, Governor Haskell that night, he calls his personal secretary, he says, go to Guthrie, get the state seal. Uh, he's in Tulsa, he commissions his train to go back to Oklahoma City. Uh, his secretary goes and gets the state seal, brings it back to the Lee Huckins Hotel in downtown Oklahoma City. He slaps a sign on the door to his hotel room and says, Governor's Office, and he moved the Capitol that very night to Oklahoma City. Of course, you can imagine the folks in Guthrie went crazy about this. Well, the Supreme Court tosses out the election on a technicality. They didn't word the ballot. Uh, language correctly. So in December of 1910, the legislature meets in Oklahoma City and they decide they pass a law and say that, uh, that the capital is going to be in Oklahoma City and they select the site of the capital on a plot of land that was donated by William Harn and John Culbertson about two miles northeast of the city center of Oklahoma City. And so that becomes the spot where we're going to have the new capital. But the folks in Guthrie say, we're not quite done yet. They get their own initiative petition together, and uh, there's going to be another election in November of 1912. In November of 1912, Oklahoma City wins the election again, and that puts the matter to bed so we can finally start in uh, 1914, seven years after statehood, we can finally start the process of building our state capital. Here's a few of the key players that, that you need to know about the Capitol building. So there was a Capitol building commission, and that was the commission that was in charge of the project. Uh, the members of the commission were selected by the governor, and it had to have at least one Republican being of the minority party at the time. Layton and Smith were the architects. Solomon Layton was a prominent Oklahoma architect. He designed everything from schoolhouses to courthouses. Uh, the Skirvin Hotel in Oklahoma City, the Marlin Grand Home in Ponca City, the Bizzle Library on the OU campus are all Solomon Layton buildings. He has over 40 buildings on the National Register of Historic Places. James Stewart and company were selected from New York to be the capital builders because they had the low bid and they had just finished building the Utah Capitol and had also built the Idaho Capitol. So they were no stranger to capital building projects. Governor Robert Williams came in in 1915 and he pretty much put himself in charge of the Capitol building project, which he was a bit of a miserly person and also a micromanager. So the fact that the project came in uh, on budget was uh, in large part due to, to his work. And Edward P. Boyd was the superintendent for the state of Oklahoma. Well, he was superintendent on the Capitol project hired by the state. But interestingly enough, he had been a federal employee, built the federal post office in Oklahoma City, and they actually wrote to President Woodrow Wilson and asked if uh, they could uh, borrow uh, Edward Boyd uh, for the capital project. And Woodrow Wilson granted his permission, and Boyd ended up being paid $300 a month. One of the things Boyd said during that process is he said, the Oklahoma Capitol is the best constructed and cheapest public building anything like its size in the country. And that's true. The Utah Capitol that had just been built by James Stewart and company was about a two and a half million dollar project. Uh, our capital was a million and a half dollars and they squeezed every drop that they could out of that to be able to get the capital. Groundbreaking ceremony was held on July the 20th of 1914. About 5,000 people attended that ceremony. 
Governor Cruz turned the first dirt. In fact, that silver-plated pickaxe that he used is now in the State Capitol Museum that the Oklahoma Historical Society has curated inside the State Capitol. So you can go see that beautiful pickaxe that he used, in addition to a lot of other key items. There's a uh, priceless artifact that's on display in there that you're going to want to see, and it's the hard hat that I wore on the Capitol Restoration Project. So. <laughs> Um, we, we have that under 24 hours surveillance and security just to make sure that nobody's going to come steal that important artifact. Uh, one of my favorite things about old newspaper articles, which I assume that many of you like history, otherwise you probably wouldn't be here, but those old newspaper articles, they wrote about everything and they published the entirety of the speeches that were made that day. And one of my favorite parts was from Lee Cruz where he said, this is not a time for speech making, but a time for work. Talking may be all right in arranging and planning for a state capital, but talking never built a capital, never will. But then he went on to give a really long speech. So. <laughs> so this is the progress of construction on the building, and I'll point out a few things. I've got my handy-dandy laser pointer here, which I always like to use. So a few things of note. First of all, this is summer of 1915. One of the things I want you to notice about our capital is the structure of the building is concrete and it is not steel. So concrete was coming into form and use as a structural building material in the early part of the 20th century. For a while, we believe the Oklahoma Capitol was the largest concrete infrastructure building in the world. I don't know if that's true, but I haven't heard anything to say it's not true, so I keep saying it until somebody can disprove me. Um, you can see the progress here coming in, but one of the things I also like to point out is remember those back in those days, they didn't really haul materials using roads. Roads were bad and vehicles were unreliable. So if you can see in this photo, they ran railroad tracks right up to the building here. And so all of the materials that came from all over to get to build our state capitol, they built a spur off the main railroad line all the way around the capitol building. So all that stone that came in, all those materials came right to the base of the building and on train cars there, which is pretty interesting. You can see the progress on the building. You can see the stone starting to go up here in 1916. By, by the spring of 1917, you can see most of the limestone was already on the building. And one of my favorite things right here you can see on this photo is uh, James Stewart and Company didn't come on board officially until August of 1915. The Capitol Building Commission managed the building of the structure of the building all the way up to the third floor level. And they used it using day laborers that they hired for that particular project. So I found that to be quite interesting. And this is a great old photo that you see in the archives of the Oklahoma Historical Society. So that, that would have been uh, either a materials house or something that they would have used uh, for the workmen or the foreman there. You know, you'll see that even today on the, on the Capitol project, we erected trailers out on the lawn for, for the workers and the people who were administering the project, and I suspect that that's part of that as well. There were warehouses out there to store materials as well. So all kind of, uh, you know, you've got to kind of figure it's a little city that's out there. So the dome, I always like to talk about the dome. Uh, the, uh, there's a lot of myths about the dome on the Capitol, and I like to dispel those. The first myth I usually hear is the reason we didn't put a dome on the building is we ran out of money. That's actually not true. The other myth I hear is that because of material shortage during World War I, that's the reason we didn't put the dome on. That's not true either. The reason we didn't put the dome on is because the capital was going to cost $1.5 million, and that's what the legislature had appropriated to build the building. Now, remember, one of the things they wanted to accomplish was they wanted to get all of state government under that one roof in, and they, so they could stop paying rent in downtown Oklahoma City office buildings. So what they didn't want to do was build a smaller capital and save some money to put on an ornamental dome. So they didn't want to spend the money on something pretty. They wanted to save their money, build a bu building big enough to get everybody inside of it. So the dome would have cost between, you know, $180,000 and $500,000, just depending on the materials used. And so they decided, we'd use the term in construction called value engineering. They decided to value engineer the dome out of the project. But one thing that they did do that was a lot of foresight, the legislature said, when you're building the Capitol, be sure to build it with a structural support necessary to support a dome in case they want to come put a dome on the building later. And that's what they did. 
So in 2002, the reason we were able to put the dome on the building is that structure had already been incorporated into the design of the building. Governor Williams was for a dome. He wasn't necessarily against a dome, but he also didn't want to appropriate extra money to go and put the dome on. Uh, he, he said, I'm not against putting a dome on the Capitol, but I do not think the time is right just now for spending that much money when the state is in need of so many other necessary and useful institutions. In fact, one of the things he would prefer to spend the money on was the establishment of the, universe, of the state hospital, which is now the University of Oklahoma Hospital, just down the street from the Capitol. So this is our completed Capitol building, June 30th of 1917. You can see it's a big capital kind of in the middle of a dirt field in the middle of nowhere, and that's exactly what it was. Uh, two and a half miles from the city center, there was one streetcar line that went out there, but it was pretty much by its lonesome. As I mentioned, a million and a half dollars built that building, which just think about that. Today, we can lose a million and a half dollars in the couch cushions at the Capitol, but uh, <laughs> back in those days, it built a big, beautiful building. There were only three floors authorized in statute, and so they got, had to get a little creative when they were uh, building the building also. So the, uh, uh, the uh, very lowest floor they called the sub-basement. The next floor was the basement. So uh, in today, the second floor was the first floor, the third floor was the mezzanine, the fourth floor was the second floor, the fifth floor was the third floor, and the sixth floor was the attic, so just three floors <laughs> in the Capitol building some of the materials that they used on the building. So there's, um, and, and I got asked, I did a tour uh, for a group that's in town for a convention today, and they asked, well, why didn't we use native stone on the Capitol building? And quite, uh, the, the answer is pretty easy. It was too expensive. It was too expensive to quarry it. And so that's why most of the lime, the building, the stone on the building is limestone that was quarried out of Bedford, Indiana. It was cheaper to quarry it there and bring it down on train cars than it was to quarry native stone here. And so all the bids for native stone came in way high. So there's actually a base layer of native stone that was Tishomingo red granite from a quarry called Ten Acre Rock near Troy, Oklahoma. And so that was put on what, what today we call the ground floor and first floor level. And then all above that is Hoosier Gray Indiana limestone from Bedford, Indiana. The floors throughout the building, other than the today's ground floor, which is all new construction, but the floors were Alabama marble. The wall bases and stairways were Vermont marble. All the walls were meant to be uh, limestone blocks, but they, once again, value engineering. They did hollow tile blocks that are covered in plaster. There were four elevators in the building. It was built with an internal vacuum cleaner system, which I think Solomon Layton must have really liked because if you go to the Marlin Grand Home in Ponca City, which was built about the same time, they have an internal vacuum cleaner system that was put in there too. So it must have been high technology for the day. Uh, there are ornamental plaster ceilings. There's a beautiful grand staircase. The railing around the second floor oculus is actually not marble. It is alabaster that was quarried in northwestern Oklahoma around the alabaster caverns area. So that's a fun trivia fact. Talking about the need for restoration. Well, uh, the Capitol was built in 1917, and the building was really used and abused for many, many years until we get... It wasn't until about the 1990s that anybody around the Capitol started really thinking about the idea of historic preservation and preserving the building. And all during that time, you know, they brought in air conditioning into the building. They'd covered over historic ceilings. They had done things like build offices in it out into historic marble corridors with plaster walls. And so really anything went at any time. And so a lot of that damage starts to get undone a little bit in the 1990s. But the reason that precipitated the need for the, uh, the restoration project was on the exterior. The, uh, the infrastructure was failing, and, and same way on the interior. The infrastructure that kept the building running was failing, and that was really the need for the project. So let's talk about the exterior restoration a little bit. This is some of the damage that we encountered when we started the building. First of all, you have over here, uh, you have joints that are supposed to have mortar in them that hadn't had mortar in them for who knows how many years. And so uh, what happens with your mortar joints, when it rains, you get moisture, they get in, it gets in and behind the stone, you have iron cramp anchors that hold the stone to the building structure. Well, when those iron anchors rust, they expand. As they expand, they press against the stone. And then uh, you have what we call spalling, which is pieces of your stone building start falling off. 
Now, if it's a small piece, you know, okay, you know, this, this is a little spall right there. But if it's a big piece, you don't want to be walking underneath that when that thing spalls off. So it did become a life safety issue. You have on here, you have a stone uh, water drainage issues. Stone started corroding, started sloughing off the surface of the stone. Once again, more mortar issues over here. Uh, the windows. So all of the, the capital was built to be quote unquote fireproof. So originally there were no combustible elements, no wood windows, no wood wall bases, no wood doors, none of that kind of stuff. Our capital was built in 1917 and there was really a big capital building boom in the United States from really about the 1880s through the 1920s for a couple of different reasons. One of those reasons was is that states started to outgrow their original capitals. As government grows, they begin to need new capitals. But the other reason that they began to build new capitals is capitals started burning down. And uh, with it, all those important documents. So in this one, they made a concerted effort. They wanted to be a fireproof building. Well, this is all great and good until your windows, you don't take care of them and they start rusting and corroding and letting in all of the elements into the building. You can see a cast iron spandrel panel here, the condition that it was in, once again, rusting, corroding, in terrible shape. And then our tunnel that goes underneath, from the Capitol underneath Lincoln Boulevard, you can see you really needed more of a canoe to get through it than to walk through that thing. Other damage that we encountered, warped and corroded original doors, stair railings that were not appropriate. Uh, you, you, we had light well walls that were failing, sidewalks that were failing, so all kind of issues all the way around the building. Uh, our exterior team, so we decided to split the project up into interior and exterior. And the reason that we did that is we felt like that it would, uh, we could hire the experts who have particular expertise. We might have a, a, a company that's great at interior restoration, but exterior stone restoration is its own whole beast. And so there were companies that had a particular expertise in that, and we wanted to make sure that we got the right companies on board. So J.E. Dunn Construction was our exterior contractor. They had done the Kansas Capitol and the Minnesota Capitol and the Wyoming Capitol, but they'd also done historic buildings like Union Station in Kansas City, the World War I Memorial in Kansas City. So they, they were really experts at exterior stone restoration. You can see here the list of folks that we had, and this isn't even really an exhaustive list uh, of people, but it, it takes a massive team on both sides to be able to get this thing done. This was our scope of work on the exterior project. There are 12 elevations going all the way around the building, and we would have to scaffold up uh, all of those elevations. Now, we didn't do it all at once because we couldn't do all of the work at once. So at any given time, we had about three elevations of the building scaffolded, and then as we finished one, we swung it around the building in a clockwise fashion. They, uh, the scaffolding alone on this project was a little about, about three and a half million dollars uh, because we had to be able to get the scaffolding up close to the building and then um, and we had to have our people that had to be able to work very closely to it. We did over 4,600 stone repairs throughout the process. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Over 21 miles of mortar joints all the way around the building were completely repointed. We cleaned all the limestone and granite surfaces. All 477 original steel windows were completely restored. We installed new doors, new stair railings. We waterproofed the tunnel, installed a new copper roof, and then put in new retaining walls and landscaping. So uh, major, major work effort to go into restoring the exterior of the building. So we get into the stone repair part of it. So stone repair is its own thing, but really, uh, not much has changed in 2,000 years. A lot of the techniques for how you repair stone and how you install stone and do mortar joints are the same as it's been, you know, since Jesus was alive. This, uh, this guy right here, he's repointing mortar joints. You can see he's got his trowel and he's got his mortar right here. It's the same way they've been doing it for years and years. And we went back and actually got the original limestone uh, the original mortar recipe so that we could mimic that for the limestone. One of the problems we'd had in the past is they put in a mortar that was too hard for the stone. So when the building shifts a little bit, as buildings natural do, that, that mortar just cracks right out of there. We had to get the right mortar for our stone. 
This, you can see these guys wielding up a 2,000 pound block of stone. Now, in most cases, we did not replace entire blocks of stone, but if they were so damaged that they really couldn't be salvaged, then we did th that on occasion. And to see those guys up here, four or five stories above the ground, wielding that piece of stone into place, I mean, I have, I have so much respect for the people that do this kind of work because it's just incredible. By the way, this photo was taken during the teacher strike. So all what's going on down there is about 10,000 teachers on the ground doing all of their thing. And these guys are just up here working away. He's doing a Dutchman repair right here. And then you can see the before and after right here. Uh, this is all new stone right here. Uh, you can see that's from right there. We had to replace all of the stone. And of course, it went through a cleaning process. And then you can see all that new mortar in those joints up there as well. So this is how you do a stone repair. And uh, I'm showing you here an ornamental stone repair, although this holds for any damaged piece of stone. Now, what we did is called a Dutchman repair. And in Dutchman repair, you can cut out the effect, the damaged part of the stone, and replace that with a new piece of stone without having to replace the whole big section of stone. So what you do, you see right here, we had an eagle at the top of a column capital. Well, the eagle's wing was chipped, and that's what's in here in this red box. Now what they did is they cut out the damaged section there and then they made a template. And so that would tell them to, to create a new piece of stone that they would attach with a stainless steel rod and with, a, uh, uh, and with a, uh, a, uh, an, an adhesive that is appropriate for the stone. So they would attach that in and then a stone carver would come along and carve it up so that it matched what was there before. Now, we did quite a few ornamental stone carvings. In fact, we did eagle heads, eagle beaks. On column capitals, we did some of the leaves. So we did quite a bit of ornamental stone carving, but it's the same process there, there uh, that if you have a, just a damaged piece of the stone anyway, it's the same process, cut out the damaged piece and then go through this process. We went back to Indiana, back to that original quarry area to get that Bedford limestone so that it would match the stone that we have on our Capitol building. And I would dare say that you can walk around the Capitol and you can probably pick out some of those new stones, but you have to look pretty hard because uh, we did a great job color matching those to the rest of the stone. Window repair. Windows were one of the most difficult aspects of the entire project, both interior and exterior. What we originally thought is that we could take all these parts and pieces, take them out, send them off to Kansas City, get them restored, they would come back, we'd put them in and go on about our business. What we didn't realize till we got into the project is that the windows are actually mortared into the structure of the building. So to take all that stuff out, we would have had to do a lot of damage to the stone around it. It would have cost us a ton of money. So what we did was we took out the components that we could take out, but then we ultimately had to build partitions into the interior offices so that they could keep working in their offices while we were working. And this is some of the work that's going on behind those partitions. First of all, we had to abate all of the lead paint off the windows. Second of all, we went through an intensive process where we actually got a sonogram so we could test and look and see what the depth of the metal was. And if it didn't reach a certain threshold, we knew that it had been rusted out and we needed to replace it. Uh, so that was quite a long process. And then while we were doing that in Kansas City, the sashes and the glass and all those things were being done. They shipped those to us and then we would put the new, the new pieces in. And then we had to go through a paint process. So it's a rust inhibitor, then a primer, and then a final coat of paint, which by the way, that final coat of paint is 400 bucks a gallon. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a little bit pricey. Uh, and then uh, on the interior, these are steel windows. So in the summer, they conduct the heat. In the winter, they conduct the cold. We wanted to try and get as much thermal protection as possible. So we add a storm window on the inside so that we could try and get as much thermal protection as we could. Uh, each window was about a six month process to do. Now, of course, we didn't do one window at a time, but it, this is a slog. This was one of the worst parts of the project. This is that historic main entrance to the Capitol. Now, these pocket doors had been hidden behind the walls for about 30 years before we brought them out and went through that restoration project. These guys right here are going over every square inch with a uh, putty knife and, and epoxy and any crack or imperfection, they're filling that in. 
Because the last thing you want is these doors to get wet once we've done all the painting and all the repairs and for them to start rusting from the inside out. So this took about three months for those guys to do that. It was very labor intensive process. And then down here you can see uh, down, uh, the pigeons make quite a mess down here on our nice portico. So we put up a little bird netting for them there. Lighting restoration, both on interior and exterior. This was a major part of our project. And so uh, St. Louis Antique Lighting was our company. They've done the lighting in about 30 state capitals. They're incredible. Uh, you can see here uh, on this exterior fixture, some of the parts and pieces are missing. Well, St. Louis Antique Lighting was not only able to restore the light fixture, plus rewire for LED. We're 100% LED inside and outside the building, but they were able to fabricate those parts and pieces that had been missing there. And then you can see the difference on this, this light fixture too. You can see uh, one of the little sculptural pieces is missing down here. Some of them had, I don't know what these are called, their little wings or whatever were missing. But uh, St. Louis Antique Lighting was able to refabricate anything that we needed to make those light fixtures whole again. This is our tunnel. Uh, uh, there are three things that you should never mess with uh, with legislators. One of them is where they sit on the floor. Uh, the second one, I'm talking about the chamber floor where they vote. The second one is where their office is or mess with anything in their office. The third is you should never mess with their parking. And we messed with all three many times during the project. And so you can, this tunnel goes from the Capitol and it's moving east underneath Lincoln Boulevard to a parking lot across the street. Now, we, to waterproof it, we had to dig up the whole thing and re-waterproof it. And in the midst of that, we struck oil. And uh, <laughs> because remember, we're in the middle of the, the old historic Oklahoma City oil field. So, but we didn't strike the Beverly Hillbillies, all our problems are over kind of oil. We struck more of the call the environmental folks because now we got a problem kind of oil. So those were some of the challenges we had to deal with. But not only that, this is in the middle of the House of Representatives parking lot. So we had to take over their parking lot for about six months. And then when we got to Lincoln Boulevard, we had to dig up Lincoln Boulevard. So where does Lincoln go while we're doing that work? Through the House of Representatives parking lot. <laughs> I'm telling you, they loved us. We were so popular with all of them. They, they loved us. But uh, we waterproofed it. And now you can see this is the before. This is the after. So now you have a beautiful way, for, a beautiful dry way for people to come into the building now from that tunnel entrance, and it's really nice. Copper roof, uh, we originally didn't think we would need to replace the entire roof. Once we got into investigations, we found out that we absolutely did. So we decided to pull the trigger, about nine and a half million dollars, and replace the entire roof for the building. I'll tell you this, uh, all along the way in this project, there were two words that I hated to hear, and they were unforeseen circumstances. And we hit them time and time again. But it's just natural. When you are dealing with a hundred and something year old building, and when you are trying to do things like modernize a building that was not meant for things like computers and cabling and all of those kinds of things, you continually hit snags. Um, our mantra on this project was no band-aids. We did not want to leave a project, we did not want to leave a headache for someone else five years down the road to, to come in. So uh, when we had this roof project come up, J.E. Dunn pre presented us several options. And one of the options was, well, we can kind of fix this and get you 10 years down the road. We said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not here to, fig to, to kind of throw a Band-Aid on it and make it somebody else's problem. We're here to fix problems. So we decided to go ahead and do the full roof replacement because if your envelope isn't tight, all of the stuff you do inside doesn't matter. If you're leaking water, if you're having damage, it just doesn't even matter. So we put the roof on and we're glad we did. Why did we use copper? First of all, it's that historic building material. But secondly, a well-maintained copper roof should last 80 years at least. And so uh, it's, it was the right decision for the project. I'm glad we did it. It was hard at the time because I was not planning on that nine and a half million dollars. But you know what? What are you going to do? Transitioning to the interior restoration, um, uh, these are some of the conditions that we encountered on the interior. So at its heart, this is an infrastructure project. Now, did we make the building prettier? Yes. Did we make it more functional? Yes. But we had to do all of those infrastructure things, plumbing, mechanical, electrical, all the guts of the building that make the building work 
that was the heart of this project. So we encountered things like you can see here, the spaghetti mess of wiring that was above most of the ceilings in the building. 80% of that wiring was abandoned in place, by the way. Um, but guess what? We're working in an occupied building. We don't have the luxury of getting into an area like this and just ripping stuff out. We had to trace out every single one of those wires and figure out where they go and what they're doing because we can't just come cut it out. So we have to install new, transition over to new, and then rip out old. It was, uh, it was a logistical nightmare and uh, it was something that we continually had to work through. Uh, one time we cut the Senate's phone line in the middle of session. And um, uh, the, the Senate at the time was, had not transitioned over to what we call a VoIP, vo voice over internet. So nowadays, your phone comes through your internet cable and it's one cable. So if you cut it, you just replace the one. The Senate still had an analog phone line system. So we cut a cable about that big around that had like a million lines in it going. And so there, I've got a picture of the guys and I gotta find it somewhere. I got a picture of one of the guys sitting there in a chair, individually putting all those little lines back together for the Senate's antiquated phone system. But it's kind of good that happened because I finally convinced them to go to the VoIP system after that. So um, I call this picture, friends don't let friends glue carpet over marble. Um, what happened over the years, like I told you, they'd build offices out into historic corridors. Well, we got to carpet the office so they would glue the carpet over the marble. Well, what happens in those early days, especially the, the, the glue, the mastic would sink down into the marble and it would stain it permanently. So if you go to the Capitol today and you're walking through different corridors and you might say, why is, why is that marble stained? I thought they restored the Capitol. It is still stained and we left the original marble for two reasons. A, it's original and it's a historic preservation project so we did the best we could. Uh, B, it's a monument to don't make stupid decisions with your building in the future. So uh, we would leave that. You can see the condition of the original cast iron plumbing here. Uh, the plumbing was on the base of just giving up completely. White flag of surrender. I mean, it was held up with baling wire and duct tape and whatever else they could find. Um, over, the electrical system in the building was completely antiquated. You know, well over 50 years old. In fact, in some places they were still using original wiring from 1917 in the building. So, and then this, kind of a typical example of how they had treated some of the interior spaces. So you, oh, here you see an original corridor, but they put in a drop ceiling for air conditioning that, that, um, that uh, uh, obscured the original barrel vault plaster ceiling. And then at one point in time, they decided to put this marble overlay thing down the corridor and then put the carpet like inside. Those aren't rugs. That's actually carpet that's, in, that's installed into the marble overlay. It was the ugliest thing you've ever seen in your life, and it was an embarrassment. Um, that's just some of the things. This uh, historic plaster ceiling that when they put air conditioning in, whenever in the 70s and 80s, they put in the drop-in ceiling and they obscured the historic area. I call this one the path of least resistance because this happened over and over again where they would run wiring and cabling through a historic, uh, through a historic public area. Uh, this I call the hallway of horrible doors. Um, this is three different door types within about a 30 feet of each other. So no attempt made for any kind of consistency through the process and the project. Uh, and then this is what really got legislators to sit up and really do something about the Capitol. In, in 2014, toward the end of the legislative session, a piece of concrete, because it had gotten wet and that rebar had gotten wet, spalled off and fell through the drop-in ceiling onto a staffer's desk. And uh, thankfully it happened over the weekend, there was nobody there, but that concrete was, you know, yay big around. And had it hit somebody, I mean, I don't know that it would have killed anybody, but it would have made somebody have a really bad day. And that's when the legislature said, you know, maybe we ought to do something about this. And uh, because in 2012, we had a bond issue, I worked in the pro tem's office at the time, we had a bond issue go to the House of Representatives. Were you in in 2012? Okay, you were gone, so you get, you get, uh, you get a pass, but um, uh, it, it was a $160 million bond issue to fix the Capitol, and it takes 51 votes to pass something on the House floor, and it got 15. I mean, just went absolutely nowhere. In 2013, they put money into a, a uh, they appropriated $120 million 
uh, $120 million in cash for it, but they wrapped it into a tax cut bill, and the Supreme Court tossed it out and said, that's log rolling, you can't put two different subjects in the same bill. Finally, in 2014, after our little spalling incident here, the legislature passed a clean $120 million bond bill. Now, was it enough to do the project? No way. But we actually didn't know how much we needed. So we took that first amount of money and we started the investigation and we were able to go back to the legislature in 2016 and say, okay, you give us another $125 million and we'll be able to finish this project. Which by the way, so our project has come in, $245 million in bonds, we've earned interest and premium on those bonds to use toward the project. So $280 million. Kansas was $330 million. Uh, New Jersey was 300 million, uh, Minnesota was 310 million. We brought our capital project in at much lower than those other ones and it speaks to the management not only from our side at OMES but our construction companies were really really invested into solving problems and giving the taxpayers what they deserve for this building. This is our interior team, it was Manhattan Construction. FSB were the architects and engineers, we had historic preservation. And then a long line, OESCO, Electrical, Matherly, HVAC, Evergreen Architectural Arts, which I'll talk about here in another minute or two. Um, they're the ones, the, the paint experts. They are the uh, historic paint consultants. They've done historic paint restoration work in buildings all over the world. And they were the exact right team for our Capitol building. And I'm so thrilled we were able to get them. The Crucible was the foundry in Norman that had, had done the Guardian statue, but also did our brand new bronze state seal on the ground floor, and I'll show you photos of that here in just a second. This is our scope of work, and it, actually this is just to make it fit on a slide. There's a lot more to it than this, but um, it's the guts of the building, like I said. I always like to say that now uh, our state capitol is a beautiful historic building from 1917, but all the guts of it, the stuff that makes it run, the plumbing, the mechanical, the electrical, the data, all those things are brand new, modern 21st century. It should be a long, long time before we have to do any kind of a project like this again. I, I like to throw this slide in here and for one reason and one reason only. Uh, some people, especially toward the beginning of the project, think, oh, you guys just were going in there you're going to make legislators' offices nicer. You're going to do a little, it's carpet and paint and that kind of thing. And this is, these are the pictures that I took that show you that this was an invasive, intrusive project. We had to do some heavy work. Now, this is uh, demolition in the uh, Senate member offices, uh, getting, uh, getting ready to install all those modern things. And I'll tell you this, we didn't demolish anything historic. So we created what I would compare to a zoning map for the entire building. So we would go into an area and our historic preservation consultants would say, there's original marble, there's an original plaster ceiling, this is a preservation zone. So that means you can't mess with it. Here's a restoration zone, which means something's been done to it in the past, but it has original material, you need to restore it. In areas like this, there was no original marble, it was basically concrete ceiling, concrete floor, nothing original there. We called that adaptive reuse. And what that meant was we could wipe it off the face of the map and start over again because we weren't going to be impacting anything that was truly historic. And so uh, you see this is the ground floor, what we used to call the basement. Now I got to talk about our demolition crew here. Now there were no machines to get uh, some of this out of the building. We were able to get some of these excavators in, but to get all this material out of the building, you know how they did it? One wheelbarrow at a time. One wheelbarrow at a time. There were, there were people who spent an 8, 10, 12 hour day making wheelbarrow loads back and forth in and out of the building. I mean, you want to talk about hard, hard work and people that I respect immensely because I wouldn't want to do it for anything in the world, but they did. Uh, the, the folks that worked on this building, they worked very, very hard. You can see here, excavating for new plumbing. Uh, this was in the governor's suite. Uh, getting ready to do work. We put in a brand new elevator, so we had to excavate out there. Uh, so the work here was hard, uh, but it was worth it. The infrastructure. So one of the things that the building had never had before is an emergency power generator. You would think the state capitol would have an emergency power generator, but what would happen is when the power went out, they had a 
put a generator on a truck, bring it to the Capitol, hook it up. I mean, it might take, who knows, six, seven hours, whatever. And so we put an emergency power generator right here. This guy right there is a million bucks. Uh, it was custom built for the Capitol. It's natural gas fed. And so when we lose power, it kicks on immediately. And you don't have to keep filling up di diesel tanks. It'll just run as long as ONG keeps pumping out the natural gas. And so we got a chance to use that during the ice storm at the end of 2020, uh, as if 2020 wasn't terrible enough, right? Uh, but remember that big ice storm. So this thing got its real world test during that time. Now it doesn't, uh, it won't fuel the whole capital, but emergency things like elevators, security, emergency exit lighting, uh, to, it has, uh, it pow keeps all the power going to all the IT and data closets throughout the building. So it's a big, big deal uh, to get that going. You can see plumbing lines going in here. For the first time in the building's history, we conditioned the public areas and the rotundas, and those are those big units that we put on the roof there. Brand new modern electrical switch gear, brand new modern equipment into our mechanical room for the HVAC system. Uh, on the ground floor in the West Wing was where we started because that's where all the utilities come into the building. And so you can see here, we dug down below, we put in electrical conduit. Uh, this is that court. This right here is this corridor. So uh, you can see the work that was going on uh, to, get, to get all that ready. All of the marble in the entire building went through a complete restoration, nine step grinding and polishing process to get it back. A lot of the marble in the building was not white anymore, it was more brown, and now it's a gleaming white again. And so this is the before and after of that ground floor West Wing corridor. The Supreme Court, one of my favorite rooms in the building, is one of the most ornamental rooms in the building. So we scaffolded it all up through the Supreme Court. We did all of our plaster repairs. And then we came in with a paint scheme. If you've been in the Capitol, you might have seen before. Most of the paint scheme was a pastel pink and green kind of color, not original to the building, and didn't really highlight the plaster in the best way. So you can see the work that they did to come through here and to paint. One of my favorite things that we were able to do is to replicate the original light fixtures that were in there. So you can see these are some, I would consider these Art Deco fixtures that were probably added in the 1950s or 1960s. And so we were able to come through and to replicate the original fixtures with St. Louis Antique Lighting. We found enough parts and pieces that they could make molds and make replicas. And so this is the completely restored uh, Supreme Court room. The Blue Room. So this is where Evergreen Architectural Arts really got a chance to shine. Now you can see what the Blue Room looked like before, and we really took the opportunity to sort of zhuzh things up in the Blue Room. The Blue Room is the ceremonial room used by the governor. They use it for things like ceremonial bill signings, like Tad and I were in that room just a couple of weeks ago. They use it for uh, meetings with dignitaries and press conferences, but you can see it's kind of plain. And what we did in there is, uh, this is Joe Batchelor. Uh, we went through and Joe said, oh, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Joe said, you know, we can really do something special in here. So he hand painted this ceiling. And then uh, you can see maybe over here, some of these urns, his wife is also on his team and an incredible artist. And she painted all the urns going all the way around the room. And they use a similar technique that they use on how they painted the Sistine Chapel. So not much has changed through all that time. But we had an opportunity really to take the blue room up a notch. We don't have the blue on the walls anymore, but it's much more blue accented with the carpet and the furniture and the draperies and the paint on the ceiling. So uh, when you're in that room, it's very, I want, the word I can think of is regal. It's a lot more regal than it was before. And uh, this is, uh, watching them do this work was just incredible. Oops. This is the house chamber. So uh, we, did, we did work in the house chambers, plaster repair, paint, lighting, sound system, the whole nine yards. Now one of the things, the house chamber had been restored in 2000, but one of the things about the whole Capitol building is that it had never been professionally painted. So when the Capitol was built in 1917, they didn't have the money for paint. So it was white floors, white walls. Over the years they would paint, but they did not do it professionally. They would bring in people like uh, prisoners, or art students. 
And so in 2000, when they did the renovation in the house chamber, they brought in art students from UCO to do the painting. Well, that's great and all, but one of the things is, is, is uh, a lot of the detail in this plaster got lost with how they painted it. So a lot of those great details sort of blended in the background. Well, Evergreen was able to use the glazing technique, and now look how much detail you can see in that plaster. It just pops right out at the eye for you. All of the stained glass was completely restored. Uh, as I mentioned, we're 100% LED, so all, all of the stained glass is lit by LED, and it just pops now. It's really incredible. So this is the before from the house, and this is the after from the house. Now this is facing toward the dais, so what, one of the things that you can't see in this photo is probably one of the biggest changes that was made is, if you've been in the house chamber in the back gallery, they had a big glass enclosure. And that was put in in the 1970s for the press and for people to be able to sit up there and talk and laugh at all the elected officials, right? <laughs> and so uh, we wanted to restore both chambers, House and Senate, back to their original look and feel. So we took out those glass, uh, glass chambers in the back of the galleries and, uh, and put just regular seating up there. This is a before and after of the Senate lounge. Now, one of the things that we did is Gary Beam, who owns St. Louis Antique Lighting, which his story is incredible. Gary owns a historic home in St. Louis. In the 1970s, he had a historic light fixture in his home, couldn't find anybody to fix it, so he just started tinkering around with it in his basement. And then, lo and behold, he fixes it. And then next thing you know, his neighbors are saying, can you fix mine? And so Gary starts tinkering around. Now he owns a company where they've done the light fixtures in capitals and historic buildings all over the country. And um, uh, St. Louis Antique Lighting was not only able to uh, repair our fixtures, but able to fabricate new ones, like those ones in the Supreme Court. They've scanned every catalog, lighting catalog, it, that's in the Library of Congress going back to the 1880s. And so he was able to come in and say, okay, we don't have anything, we can't replicate this, and we really don't know. This is the Senate Lounge. We don't know what kind of uh, chandelier originally hung in the Senate lounge. But what he could say is, I can find you something that's appropriate to the period. So we were able to fabricate this guy right here for the Senate lounge. It's period appropriate. Uh, it fits the room. This is what I call like nice Home Depot, maybe, um, that was in there before. Not really all the best. And so uh, this guy right here is about 35000 bucks. Um, but... It's going to be there forever now. I mean, it is, it is a showpiece. It is a nice focal point for the building. Uh, the other thing we came in, you can see, we did the paint throughout here, new draperies, new rug, and of course, as part of our building, one of the things I wanted to make sure that we could do is not renovate this entire building and then still have their, their shabby garage sale furniture that they had throughout the building. So we had money so that some of the public spaces and the nice spaces we could give them to be able to buy new furniture that's appropriate for the room. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you're not having these great spaces that basically look like they got the, the furniture at the flea market. The, the rotunda was, uh, of course, one of the, the jewels of the entire Capitol. We scaffolded all the way up to the, the base of the dome and then did all the plaster and repair work throughout there. And so probably one of the biggest changes that we made to the rotunda was you can see over here the paintings. When those paintings were commissioned in the late 1960s, they covered over the original statuary niches. And so we were able to uncover those and completely restore those and light them. And so now all those paintings are back in those niches, but uh, it, in a much more appropriate way. So it's a, it's a beautiful renovation there. The ground floor rotunda, uh, one of the, the changes that we made was now that we're bringing people in through our new visitor entrance, the ground floor really changed a lot. We wanted to connect it up to the rest of the building. So we cut, what you can see here, a giant hole and created a new rotunda that was in the, the floor that we used to call the basement, but now we call the ground floor. So you can see here's before holes cut, after hole is cut, and then this is the progression of that area. And the showpiece down there is that beautiful bronze state seal that was fashioned by the Crucible Foundry in Norman. So a beautiful piece of art uh, for our capital. 
This is the new visitor entrance. The main historic entrance couldn't be used anymore as a main entrance because it's not ADA accessible. And of course, you don't want to build a nice big ramp up your beautiful staircase in front of your building. Kind of ruins the photos. So we created a new visitor entrance at the southeast corner of the building. And so we dug it out right here. This is March of 2019. And then this is in November uh, to March of 2020. And now this is what it looks like today. So there's a few benefits to this. First of all, we have uh, it's ADA compliant. It's got the ramp that comes down. Why did we go down instead of up? Well, we don't want to obscure the historic profile of the building. So if you're standing in the parking lot taking a photo of the Capitol, nothing's obscuring that beautiful classic historic view. In fact, you can't even see this entrance until you walk up to the plaza. We have a sign saying Capitol entrance and you walk down into there. So it's a great area. It's a beautiful new front door. Before people were coming in and a side entrance to the Capitol. And uh, one of our uh, oversight committee members, Steve Mason said, Coming in the side entrance is kind of like going in through the garage at your friend's house. It wasn't a, it wasn't a welcoming entry. It wasn't great. In fact, I remember one time, uh, it was OETA day at the Capitol. And that's when a bunch of, of moms and dads would bring their kids up and they'd get to interact with the OETA characters that their kids see on TV. And I remember you could only get a few people into the door of the Capitol and then everybody else had to line up outside the door to get in. And it was pouring down rain. And moms and strollers are waiting in the rain to get in their capital. What kind of a welcome is that for, that for people to come to the people's house? So now you come in this beautiful visitor entrance and you have this great vestibule. If there's a lot of people trying to get in the building at one time, now they can queue up out of the weather. And this is one of my favorite things. As they walk in those doors, we have a marble county map of Oklahoma embedded in the floor. I call it the Oklahoma welcome mat. And I will admit, I totally stole that idea. Um, we had gone to Kansas to look at their restoration project. And in the floor in their visitor center was a county map in Terrazzo. And I was like, we got to do that. So we totally stole it, but we made ours better because ours is in marble. So <laughs> this is our brand new state capitol museum that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. There were places before, little display areas all throughout the building, but not an opportunity to tell a cohesive, coherent story. So now we have 4,400 square feet on the ground floor of the Capitol where everybody comes in. We have uh, over 125 artifacts on exhibit, 13 exhibit cases, and now we can tell the story about founding documents. We can talk about the Sequoia Constitution, the Oklahoma Constitution. We talk about the three branches of government the legislative process, and then we get into the history of the Capitol, the dome project, the restoration project. So we're able to tell that story uh, in the Capitol now for the first time. And I'm telling you, I've been to quite a few Capitals. I don't know anybody who has a museum like ours uh, in our building. And so when you have a chance to go, definitely go. It's free. As long as the Capitol is open, you can get in there. And uh, it's pretty great. Uh, like I said, my hard hat is in there, so you can go spend 10 or 15 minutes just staring at it. So I do want to point this out. In the vestibule leading into our museum is this stained glass. Now, why did we put stained glass there? What, what's the story behind that? That's the original stained glass in the saucer dome. It had been in storage for 20 years, and we got it back out. We had it restored, and we reinstalled it back into the Capitol building as, as a, a kind of a homecoming. Not, of course, in its original location, but back in the building. I always like to point out some of the, the, the finds that we had uh, as we worked through this process. So here's some of the things that we encountered as we were doing the restoration project. Old soda and beer cans. So somebody had fun on the job that day. Uh, old Schlitz beer can that I, I would always Google to see what the eras are. I think that one's from the 50s. Here we found a note dated September the 21st, 1933 of a group of workers that were working and they wrapped that note up and put it in a bottle. And one of our workers, it was a dark area, stepped on it and found that note. Uh, we put that out on Facebook and actually had people identify relatives, uh, their, their grandparents and great grandparents. Uh, this is one of my favorite finds. This is a uh, newspaper clipping that was found in a window soffit. Now this is dated March 30th of 1917, just a few days before the United States entered into World War I. And the headline there, Germans torpedo another. I mean, 
that's that's history right there. This is fantastic. Oh, that's a uh, old cigarette wrappers. A Senate gallery pass from 1963. A worker signed his name to the aluminum ducting behind a wall. A Milky Way wrapper from the 1940s. I mean, and then that's just the tip of the iceberg. We found all kind of other stuff too. But, uh, and some of that stuff is on display in the Capitol Museum now. So, uh, this is my new book on the state capitol. Uh, I published this uh, on August 1st, so it's just brand new, hot off the presses. So, uh, I would say uh, it's a great book, and you're definitely going to want to read it. Uh, you can get it on Amazon, and uh, it, they may be selling it at some of your favorite bookstores. But, um, that just came out. All the proceeds go to benefit the Oklahoma History Center. So I'm not making a dime off this thing. We're, we're going to try and help out the History Center there. But we unearthed a lot of photographs that we were able, that I wrote all the captions for. I think you'll enjoy it if you decide you want to get it. And then with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. I know I went a little over Tad, so... Uh, I will absolutely do that. I would be more than happy to do that, yes. When can the Ropers tour? <laughs> I'm saying, when can the Ropers all come to tour? You know, I, people ask me all the time, it's like, Trey, do you do capital tours? And I always say, yes, I do capital tours. A project like this, uh, it's your legacy, right? It's something that you can never run away from. In fact, just today, I did a, a tour for a group of, of folks that were in town for a convention. So I love giving capital tours. And I would love to host the Ropers at the Capitol sometime. So, the uh, Capitol Museum is that under the auspices of the mu or the Capitol itself, or is that the Historical Society? Historical Society, yeah. The Historical Society manages all of the artifacts within that space, and uh, uh, like we just opened that up in March, and so at some point we'll change out cases and everything. But we've got some great stuff in there. Great stories to tell. You might have been able to tell, but it's got, we've got video elements into it, so you can go press a video and see Governor Nye talking about the Capitol. You can see um, uh, a video presentation on the Sequoia Constitution. And then we've got great artifacts like the quill pen that Theodore Roosevelt used to sign the Statehood Proclamation in 1907. That's on display in there as well. I have two questions. One is about the generator. Yes. How often does it have to be maintained? There's got to be maintenance on that. Yeah, so they run it once a week to test it out. So every Monday morning, they, they run it and test it to make sure that it's all, everything's working appropriately and it's ready to go. Okay, the other part, I, now I have two more questions. Sure. Here I go. I know, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think it was a Senate chamber, and I may have it wrong. It had blonde carpet on it, and then you put red carpet on it. There was no marble underneath the carpet? No. So in the Senate chamber, uh, they had a red stained concrete floor and the same in the House chamber. So there wasn't marble all throughout the building. In certain spaces, they just had concrete floor. And if, remember, they, they, struck, they did this on a dime. I mean, this, is a, this was a, a very uh, efficient project to be able to get everything they wanted. So in some areas, like the blue room, you saw the carpet down in the blue room, and there's marble. Well, there's just a marble border in there, and then that's concrete in the middle. So they, they uh, anywhere in office space, they, we found areas, they had red stained concrete and then green stained border. So they tried what they could to sort of zhuzh things up a little bit, make it look a little bit nicer. So in the House and Senate chambers, there was red stained concrete floors. Now when all the electronics came in, and, and we kept this going with the restoration project, of course those are carpeted now, but those are actually false floors in there. They're about yay high off the ground that lets all the electronics run to all the desks so all the members can vote. Any other questions? Yeah, we got a call. Hold on, raise your hand, and then I'm gonna give you the mic. So we got. Is there anything in the Capitol that refers to the bombing in Oklahoma City? No, not really. Um, there's, uh, it, you know, in our museum, we don't really focus on that. We focus more on the, the building itself and what happens inside the building. So, no, not that I can think of. And I can't really think of any art piece unless there's been one that's been commissioned that focuses on the bombing either. Yeah, I know they had places where they had, 
Yeah. Who made all the decisions about the specifications, about how things would be restored? Mm -hmm. How did they ever arrive at that? That's a good question. Uh, you know, it, for lack of a better word, it was a team effort. So we had weekly meetings with all the construction people and all the designers. We, we had project team meetings. And so anytime we had some of these big decisions, so uh, give you a little bit of sense of the team here. So we had OMES, which I was on the project manager on that team. But then on our, on our OMES team, we also had our own uh, um, architect who was working with us and our construction folks who were monitoring the contract. We had also hired an architecture firm, which was actually the firm of the capital architect, Dwayne Mass. So Mass Architects was what we called our AE1. And so they were our quality control. AE1 stands for Architecture and Engineering 1. They were our quality control. So they helped us navigate through and make sure that, that if something was done from the construction side, that they'd done it correctly, and they'd done it well, and that if we were billed for it, we were billed the right thing for it. So they helped us with all of that. They were involved in those meetings too. But then the construction companies both had their own architecture and engineering teams. So in some cases, it was decisions could be made fairly quickly. But remember, this is a building full of legislators and elected officials. So we didn't just come through and say for the governor's office and say, all right, guess what? Here's how we're going to build everything and you're going to love it. We're going to design it all this way. We would sat through and go month through months long meetings and say, okay, what do you need? And try to think out 10, 15, 20 years for how we're going to design space. You know, do you want a bathroom in your suite? Do you want this office to be bigger? Do you want it to be smaller? You know, what are the kinds of things? What kind of finishes should we put in here? So those processes would take months and months. So we started the project technically in July of 2014, but we didn't start construction until on the interior until August of 2015 and on the exterior until June of 2016. So uh, it was a long, long process. And then we would do a lot of things called mock-ups, especially when it came to paint colors and things like that. So mock-ups are where you would come in and you would paint a whole section of something, or in some cases for the ground floor, we actually, we didn't have anything to, to, to paint yet because it hadn't been built. So we built a little section of it and we put in lighting that was gonna be just like the lighting. And then we would paint it. Okay, here's the ceiling color, here's the wall color, here's this, and we would come in and look at it. We say, no, we don't like that. Let's go back here. Now, did Trait choose paint colors? No, I did not choose paint colors and I'll tell you why. One time my wife said, I would really like a yellow kitchen. And when she was out of town, I thought, I'm going to be really nice and I'm going to paint my wife's kitchen yellow. But I painted it school bus yellow and not the kind of yellow that she liked. So Trait doesn't do paint colors. Trait lets the experts do paint colors. But we would all be there to kind of take a look and to, to make sure and to see. So the, floor, the colors you see on the ground floor, boy, we, we argued and fought over those for months. But we got to the right decision. And that was part of that process. So, you know, people talk about these kind of projects taking forever. Well, they do take forever, but there's a reason for it. And that's because you get one shot to get it right. And it was a long, long process. And we had to bring in not only our opinions, but the stakeholders. Who was going to be using that area and how were they going to be using it? So nobody, we never came in and dictated anything to anybody. We tried to work with everybody to say, okay, let's design something that's going to work for you. Now, that was all well and good, but what happens when the Speaker of the House changes his mind in the middle of it? <laughs> you do what the Speaker of the House wants to, and we went and changed it. And so that would cost us a little bit of money, but that's okay. You know, ultimately we ended up getting it right too. And we stayed within our budget. It's why we have contingency. So uh, it's a process, but it worked, and it worked out well. So. You, the, the rock that was queried, I think you said in Indiana, the limestone. Yes. Was it not available in Oklahoma at that time, like over here at Catoosa it is now? No, um, there weren't any big limestone quarries in Oklahoma at the time that I'm aware of. And, you know, like I said, one of the, the big things is the expense. They looked at using Oklahoma granite, like down by Granite, Oklahoma, and uh, down in that area. And they also, you know, the, the, mar the marble quarry around Marble City. But it just ended up, it, the, for whatever reason, 
Either they weren't, the quarries weren't ready to go or it was for what the formations might have been too expensive to quarry, but they just weren't right and, and it was gonna drive the cost of the project up. So the legislators had actually specified, we want Oklahoma materials to be used in this. But by the time they got to the bidding process in 1915, you can look at the bids and it says, okay, um, they, they gave several, they, each company gave several different bids. They would say, okay, we're gonna do this bid is what it would cost with Oklahoma granite. This bid with Indiana limestone, this bid with Georgia marble, you know, that kind of thing. And so uh, ultimately as it came out, the limestone won out as being uh, the best material. And limestone, it's why you see it everywhere. It's a great building material. It's, it's easy enough to use, it can be carved, it's, uh, but it's durable. So, I mean, it's why Indiana limestone is used all over the place is because it's a fantastic building material. When uh, we redo the m memorial, add the addition over here, are we gonna be able to get the uh, limestone from Catoosa to match what we've got already on the building? I mean, that's a good question. We'll just have to go through that process with the okay. contractors and, and to see, you know, I'm certainly not opposed to it, but you know, you just gotta go through the process and, and you know, see, can they produce the quantity that we would need? Would it still match in the color and all those kinds of things? But those will be, once again, fun processes to work through. My question was actually about the bidding process. Mm -hmm. It must have been a nightmare. Well, you know, for, for the- every single thing? So, know? no, so we did this project, it's called design build. And in a design build project, the contractor and the architect work as a team together. So in some projects, the state goes and hires the architect and the state goes and hires the contractor, and then the state's sort of the middleman between the two. In this project, the contract and the contractor and the architect are working together, which I can't imagine doing this any other way. Because when problems arose, and they arose fairly frequently, we didn't have to go to the architect and say, what do you think? And then go to the contractor and say, what do you think? And then kind of facilitate them getting together. They were able to work together as a team and come up with a solution and it actually made this process go a lot faster. So when the bids started for this, we didn't bid this on a, uh, we bid it on a fee basis, but only for the design fees, because we didn't know what everything was gonna cost to build at that time. We had no idea, we hadn't even done investigation. So we bid it all on how much are your design and, and construction fees going to be. And so uh, there, were, there were only three companies that, that bid on both projects. And uh, those three companies were Manhattan Construction, J.E. Dunn Construction, and I believe CMS Willowbrook out of Oklahoma. This, a massive project like this, you have to be able to carry the bonding capacity to do that. Not all construction companies can do that. And not all construction companies wanted to tie themselves up for the next eight years either. <laughs> so, um, so as it turned out, uh, like I said, J.E. Dunn got the interior bid with their partners, Manhattan got, I'm sorry, the exterior bid, Manhattan got the interior bid, and that's what was, uh, and that's what we went forward with, so. I've got to say, this is the most interesting evening I have had in a long time. <laughs> well, thank I'm you. Really glad I'm, I'm glad I didn't put you to sleep. Other questions, Keith? When the um, Capitol was closed, totally, that meant all the ongoing functions like the governor's office, those, those things aren't in, don't have sessions. Those things go all year long. So all those had to be functioning from someplace else during yeah. that period of time. Where'd they go? Thankfully, you know, we're, at that point, this was 2017, October of 2017, so we had to close the building for one week to be able to make the electrical transfer over. So, uh, and we planned for that for months. First of all, we had to, it, it's a, it can be a little bit of a dangerous process because you're dealing with high, high voltage electricity and you don't want anybody in and around it. Second of all, we knew the Capitol was gonna be dark for a period of time and it just wouldn't be a place where people could work. So we knew this was coming and we started working about six months ahead of time, maybe even eight months ahead of time. Started working with all the different agencies to find places they could go. Thankfully, by that time in 2017, most everybody can, work from a laptop somewhere. Uh, and of course, as the pandemic showed, this, it might have been just good practice for that. But um, we, we started work, so the governor's office, they moved to the Phillips Pavilion on the, uh, you know, and so we, we moved printers over there for them, and, all, and the project paid for all this. It was part of the project cost. 
So we moved printers, we moved computers, we moved whatever they would need to be able to function for a week. Now, thankfully, it's October. It's not a terribly busy time at the Capitol. It wasn't an election year. We, there's no way we could have done it in an election year uh, with a November election coming. Um, uh, so we worked with all the agencies. The election board had some offices across the street in the Jim Thorpe building. The House and Senate moved, just let their people work from home for that week. Uh, the Ethics Commission, we moved into the Judicial Building. Now, here's the, here is the most difficult one, and it's the Treasurer's Office. The Treasurer's Office is a bank subject to all of the regulations and restrictions of a bank. And so we actually had to arrange for them to go to a place where they could be secure and where they could, you know, conduct, still conduct their business. Uh, and that was a test run for us because... When we did the treasurer's office in 2020, we had to move them completely out of the building. We didn't have a place for them uh, to hop in the building. And even if we did, we couldn't have put them there because they have to have a vault. They have to have all those. So we found an old Bank of America branch at uh, Britain and May in Oklahoma City. And we rented that out for a year. And the treasurer's office moved there for a year, which was kind of interesting because one of the things that came out of that is they liked it over there so much that they kept it, renting it after we were gone and they kept a bunch of staff over there too. So um, I learned so much about the workings of state government <laughs> through all this process because I learned what kind of what each agency needs and how you need to help them function. And we could not, we could not cripple agencies as a result of this project. So we had to work with them to make sure that they had everything that they needed and so I was kind of that, if you want to picture the spokes in a wheel, I'm kind of that interior section of the wheel. So I'm working with the agencies to say, what do you need? And then I'm working with OMES and other branches of state government to go, okay, we need this for IT. We need this. Uh, I coordinated more moving trucks than you want to, you know, uh, moving services, the art in the building, coordinating, protecting all the art and getting it out. We kept the art stored in a climate-controlled, secure facility for six years, um, you know, because we couldn't have it in the building where it could be uh, damaged by the dust and the, all the debris and the construction equipment and that kind of thing. So all of that logistical stuff, I, I was really kind of in the middle of a bunch of that. I picked furniture. You don't want me picking furniture, but I picked furniture. Uh, if you go into the dining room in the Capitol, hopefully you like the tables and chairs because I picked those out. So uh, uh, it was interesting. When I started off the Capitol job, my scope was really fairly narrow on what I was going to be doing. But as we got more and more into it, uh, my scope grew very rapidly because I was, I was the only full-time state employee devoted to the Capitol project. So um, uh, now, I marshaled resources from all throughout state government, but it was just me that was devoted full time to that project from the state, so. So are there any secret underground bunkers? <laughs> no, no, there's no secret underground bunkers and another myth that I like to try to dispel, uh, much to people's chagrin, there were no stables in the basement either. I get that one from, oh, there were stables, and no, there weren't. No, there was no stables, no, you know, but by 1917, we were well into the vehicular era. We weren't, we weren't riding horses into the basement of the Capitol. You didn't so. find any skeletons in the basement either? No skeletons in the basement. <laughs> um, yeah, no, no sacks of gold or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, although that one would have been good. <laughs> I'll say as far as you know. <laughs> Can you describe what in your background gave you the skill sets to be able to handle this job? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, hubris, um, unearned confidence, I don't know. Uh, no, I, first and foremost, passion for the building. I mean, I just, I fell in love with the building when I started working in there in the pro tem's office in 2010. What I love about historic buildings is it's one of the few tangible connections that we have to our past. So a building has the ability, say you go to the Overholster Mansion in Oklahoma City or the Pawnee Bill Mansion at Pawnee Bill Ranch. A building has the ability to connect you with your past and then put you in that frame of mind 
of what it must have been like to live back in that era. I love that about historic buildings, so I'm passionate about that. So that's the, that's the one thing, is you have to love it. But the other thing is, is when I went and talked to Preston Dorflinger, who was the, the head of OMES at the time, I said, I think you're gonna need somebody who has relationships with the members, and I did have that from working in the pro tem's office, relationships with the members, knows how the legislature thinks and likes to operate, and then someone who can kind of be that, like I said before, spoke in the wheel. So that I can be that person on the ground, but also when problems come up, I know who to go talk to in state government to get them through. And our construction companies loved that because they had done similar projects in other states and they were faced themselves with having to navigate through the bureaucracy of state government. So say we needed to clear out a parking lot to do a project. Well, in other projects in other states, they were the ones that had to go figure out who do you talk to in the house office to be able to get this done and how do you do it and all this other kind of stuff. Well, I was that conduit for them. So my job was to make it so that they didn't have to waste their time navigating the bureaucracy. They could come to me and then I could get that done and they could focus on what they're best at, which is doing construction. But from the opposite end of the spectrum, I was the guy that the construction folk, I could explain to the people inside the building and our stakeholders what's going on with the project. And I could say, now, construction people talking in construction ease. And I was able to say, okay, thank you for telling me that. Nobody's gonna understand that. Tell me how to, to say that in a different way so that I can go and, and talk to our folks and say, okay, this is why this parking lot needs to be cleared. This is how long it's gonna take. And there were several times I'd tell them, I'm sorry, we can't do that. I think we gotta figure out a different way to do it. The, these people are gonna freak the heck out. We gotta make sure that, you know, it's, so I was able to understand the legislature enough to be able to work with the construction folks and understand the construction folks enough to be able to work with the legislature and the elected officials. So there was just that, and, and that just came from a little bit of my background. I had done project management for a private consulting firm in the past, so I kind of had a basic understanding, although this was project management on steroids. Um, and, and so that was really what my role was, is to just clear the way and try and get this to where we could, you know, get the work done. Uh, you know, I would write a letter to legislators before every session and say, welcome to session. It's going to be dusty. It's going to be noisy. There's going to be weird smells. You cannot come to me every 15 minutes and say, can you shut that noise off? Because if we do, we will never finish this project. And thankfully, I had bosses at the time who, you know, when legislators would complain and they would go to Preston or Denise or whoever my boss was and they'd say, and my bosses would back me up and say, sorry, this is how it has to be. Um, so there was just, um, there's just a lot of that, that that we had to do as we worked through. You know, obviously we had to give a little, they had to give a little, and we had to know when was the right time to do that. And yeah, it's, I don't know what more to say. What's that? I grew up in Texas, so my family farms and ranches in a little central Texas town called Brady, which is, uh, if you're familiar with the Abilene, San Angelo area, kind of down. Oh, there it was. So was I, so yeah, <laughs> so was I. All right. There's well, a one right back here. We got one, you get one more question, Joe. OSHA on site. OSHA on site. No. We never had OSHA on site. The Department of Labor uh, uh, would come on site occasionally and we would always give them tours. Safety was a huge priority for us. In fact, you know, we, we would give tours to lay people on the site, and we always made them dress in the same type of clothing that the construction, they had to wear a reflective vest. In some cases, they had to put gloves on, even if they were just doing a tour. Um, but safety, so both companies had a dedicated safety enforcement officer on, that would, had, that would do nothing else but just roam around the job site and make sure that people were being safe. They were wearing their harnesses, that they were tied off when they needed to be tied off, and all those other kinds of things. So safety was really, really important. Through the entire project, I can only think of one injury that we had that was a, a major injury. We had a guy fall off scaffolding 
and break his ankle. And the only reason he did that is because he had modified the scaffolding without asking ahead of time. So um, we were very fortunate, thankfully, that we had, had, had no major injuries or anything like that throughout the entire process. All right, Trey, thank you so much for coming. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. And uh, just a quick reminder to everyone, next uh, Friday night we'll be watching the Will Rogers story with Will Rogers Jr. right here on Friday night.